inane letters that really don't say anything about solving the, the problem. It's a real problem about the security of this country and the people who live down there and traverse that area. And Mr. President, let's get on with it. The gentleman yields back. Uh, I yield chair, back the balance of my time. The chair recognizes Ms. Kaptur of Ohio. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oregon seek recognition? I seek to address the House for five minutes. Without objection, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're having debates about health care because Americans are nervous about changing something so important to their families, and that, of course, makes politicians nervous about reform. This skepticism is understandable. Attempting to adjust policies and programs that comprise now 17% of our economy, the biggest driver of the federal deficit that literally touches every American family, poses daunting challenges. But as people begin the analysis, the appropriate comparison is not some idealized magical state, but comparison to the path we are on, which everybody agrees is unsustainable. Medical costs left unchecked will literally bankrupt the country. The Department of Defense will spend more on health care this year than China uses to run its entire military operation for seven months. Every objective independent expert acknowledges and laments the fact that the United States is the world's health care underachiever. We pay more for health care than our major allies and competitors in Europe, Japan, and Canada, but our people get sick more often, they die sooner, and unlike any other country, people are bankrupted by medical costs, about 2,000 people per day. All the while, we have a record number of uninsured Americans, now over 50 million. Sadly, we're getting exactly what we pay for. More procedures, multiple providers, emphasis on specialty care, rather than someone who can help us with our own efforts to negotiate this complex, fragmented health care system. America actually spends more administering our health insurance system and finding ways to deny care than any other country in the world spends on providing care. Starting from scratch, we could give better care for less money, but we're not starting from scratch. We're starting with an economic and structural behemoth encompassing, as I said, 17% of the economy. It's the largest employer in most communities, and it's evolved over two-thirds of a century of public and private investment and government le legislation. Today, our hybrid system largely administered through hundreds of agencies, programs, and large providers, with the federal government paying half the bill directly. The good news is that we have proven that we can get better results for less than we are spending, and the health care reform legislation provides this framework. First, we don't need more money. In fact, if we implement the existing legislation, it can be a source of savings in the future. The good news is we don't have to deal with unproven techniques or technologies. We know what to do. We don't even have to look at foreign models that are more successful than ours. We can look right here in the United States. My community of Portland, Oregon, delivers better health care for Medicare, for instance, to its recipients than other communities where costs are twice as high. And it's not just Portland. This can be found in areas in the West, the upper Midwest. There are also innovative health care practices in the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, Gunderson Lutheran. The government itself has proven how to be more efficient. The Veterans Administration has a practice model for older citizens with complex health problems that face our veterans. The VA has automated its medical record system. It pays its doctors for performance, not procedures. And they figured out a way to get better prescription drug costs for millions of our veterans. Many of the techniques for reducing the number of unnecessary hospital admissions, for bundling services, <clears throat> for having accountable care organizations, <clears throat> are known and actually supported by my Republican friends. They've been embraced by Republican governors. 
This is not foreign territory. We know it can work. The path forward is clear. It's important not to lose two important years <coughs> in reforming our medical system, giving better health care, and starting to reduce these massive future deficits. After having identified weak spots in implementation, let's work to hold people accountable. Don't attack the CBO for scoring the bill as written, which is their job. Attack efforts to undermine the cost-saving elements of the bill. If a state can more creatively provide health care envisioned in the exchanges, let them do it. Give them the waivers and, ex and encourage them to experiment as long as they meet minimum national standards. The gentleman's time has expired. <coughs> Ms. Burkle of New York, for what purpose does the gentleman from New Jersey rise? To speak for five minutes. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support H.R. 2, legislation to repeal the so-called Affordable Care Act, a new effort to strengthen our health care system. This will be the first step to ensuring that the American people will remain in control of their own health care through a system that is patient-centered and provides health care choices, not government-imposed mandates. Many people question why we're doing this. They say, why repeal the new health care law if there are good provisions in it? Well, there may be some aspects of the 3,000-page bill, which is now law, that were commendable 10 months ago. However, the few positive provisions do not outweigh the fact that the new law's most damaging aspect is that it turns over, the federal government, turns over to the federal government the individual's right to make their own health care choices for themselves and for their families. The new law has given Washington bureau bureaucrats extraordinary power to control health care decisions of all Americans, forcing us to buy health insurance that Washington deems to be acceptable, potentially fining us for refusing to do so, which I believe would be unconstitutional, determining our choice of doctors, hospitals, or home care, deciding which medicines we can take and which medical procedures will be available to our families, putting one-sixth of our economy under government control. Let me be clear, I support health care reform. However, however, I do not support this new health care law, which represents to a very great extent a Washington takeover of our health care system. This law is creating over 150 new boards, bureaus, committees, commissions, offices, pilot programs, working groups, and agencies which will issue onerous regulations that will change our health care system forever and not for the better. Remember, over 90 percent of all Americans have health coverage for themselves and their families. Why did the last Congress insist on a virtual takeover of the other 10 percent? That's why I support the repeal, coupled with major changes to assist those who do not have coverage without harming the plans of millions of Americans who do. My colleagues, why is this repeal necessary today? Because the negative effects of this new law are already being felt and threaten the practice of medicine as we know it. This new law has eroded your right to choose your health care and your doctors and is putting bureaucrats and politicians in charge. Despite predictions from the White House, insurance premiums are not going down. To the contrary, premiums are rising across the nation for people who have insurance as insurance companies struggle to pay for the costs of a raft of new mandates imposed by Washington. Even as we speak, doctors are changing their practices because this new law discourages their ability to work as single practitioners or in group practice. In addition, doctors face more paperwork, more red tape, and more risk to their license to practice. Furthermore, the new law does nothing to solve or diminish the wave of junk medical lawsuits that force doctors, medical professions, and hospitals to practice expensive defensive medicine. Also missing from the law is any program to promote and support medical education in America, the next generation of young people who we count on us for care. At the same time, doctors and hospitals will face reduced Medicare reimbursements and even more Medicare rules and regulation causing even more physicians to refuse to treat senior citizens. And what about the promises we heard about the benefits of the new law? 
to protect Americans from being denied coverage due to pre-existing or other condition, 27 states have created their own high-risk insurance pools. Others have used an option in the law to let their residents buy coverage through a new federal health plan. Last spring, Medicare's chief actuary predicted that 375,000 people would sign up for one of these special plans by the end of 2010. In fact, the Department of H Health and Human Services reported last month that just over 8,000 people had enrolled. This difference of 367,000 enrollees raises real questions about the then majority's demand for this provision. And with claims to provide coverage for another 34 million Americans, we need to be reminded that 18 of these newly insured people will gain coverage through the financially stressed Medicaid program, which is almost broke. My colleagues, current Medicaid enrollees are already having trouble finding doctors who will see them because of low reimbursement rates. This law proposed to add another 18 million patients to a struggling and absolutely necessary program. In addition, our hospitals are already reeling. Passage of the new health care law has accelerated the layoff of hundreds of employees in hospitals in my congressional district. When, when further Medicare cuts take hold, how are these institutions going to maintain their quality of care? They aren't. And what are the advertised benefits of the new health care law? Backers actually claim the new law would reduce the federal deficit. This claim is based on dubious economic assumptions, double counting, and other budget gimmickry. It's astounding that this law counts 10 years of anticipated revenues to offset six years of new spending. Here's a simple fact. If Obamacare is fully implemented, it will not cut the deficit. The law will actually add more than $700 billion to the deficit in its first uh, uh, 10 years. I'm I support H.R. 2 and urge Congress to pass it. I yield back. Is Mr. Keating of Massachusetts for five minutes? Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor the 50th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's inaugural address and celebrate the many moments of altruism that have emerged from the simple words, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It is this expression of love of country, the spirit that President Kennedy evoked in all of us, that causes me to rise today for my maiden speech on the floor of the House of Representatives. Even 50 years later, we take from this speech the reminder that we still have work to do to improve our country, and that work is incumbent upon us to finish. As a young child, I remember watching the ceremony on January 20th, 1961. I remember the poet Robert Frost read a poem from the podium as his eyeglasses fogged up. I remember President Kennedy taking the stage and I could have never imagined the impact he would have on my generation and the generations to come. Here in Washington, President Kennedy is never far from my mind because I have the distinct honor of coming to work to the same office that President Kennedy had when he was a member of Congress. Our space is an historic treasure. And I'm so fortunate to be entrusted with the safekeeping of this memorial and all that it represents to the people of Massachusetts and every American who has been inspired by President Kennedy. My first days and weeks in Congress have been an incredible privilege, serving my community in Massachusetts and working to find solutions for the challenges that our country faces. President Kennedy's words are timeless, and we can and should learn from them today. He called on our country to remember that civility is not a sign of weakness. His words should inform our national conversation as we hopefully renew our commitment to respect and graciousness, where politics means more than stark division and glaring partisanships. Our country needs healing, and Kennedy would believe that it is up to all of us to participate in restoring this type of civility. Fifty years ago, he said, let both sides explore what problems unite us instead of belaboring those problems which divide us. I welcome this challenge, and I'll spend my time in Congress living up to those words. Good ideas are not restricted to one political party or the other. 
So I look forward to hearing from my constituents of all political stripes. If my neighbor in Weymouth has an idea to create jobs, I want to hear it. If a resident of Plymouth has a proposal on how we can move our country forward, I want to help. If a fellow citizen in Barnstable has a plan to make our country safer and stronger, I look forward to working together. In closing, let us remember that President Kennedy had a long-term vision for this country. He understood that a change in direction takes time, and we understand that a return to values that he kept will not be immediate. As he said, all of this will not be finished in the first 100 days, nor will it be finished in the first 1,000 days, nor in this life of this administration, nor even perhaps in our lifetime in this planet. But let us begin. So as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's inauguration, let us begin anew. Speaker, I yield my time back. The gentleman yields back. The chair, the, Ms. Lowy of New York. For the gentleman, for what purpose is the gentleman from um, uh, is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Tomorrow the House will vote on the Patients' Rights Repeal Act. While none of us thought that the landmark reform bill passed last year was perfect, repeal would only recreate many problems that last year's bill solved. Instead of identifying specific improvements, Republicans have proposed to repeal every single consumer protection, protections that benefit all of our constituents. We cannot allow this irresponsible bill to become law. During the debate over health insurance reform in 2009, I received countless letters from individuals throughout my district who testified to the dire need to address high costs and inadequacy in service. For example, a constituent from White Plains told me about her 27-year-old son who was battling cancer and cannot afford some of the treatments. She wrote, quote, from discrimination by insurance companies against the millions of us with pre-existing conditions, end quote, to lack of affordable care, we've had enough, quote. By ending denials of coverage based on pre-existing conditions, 9,200 residents of my congressional district with pre-existing conditions will now have access to health insurance. That is just one benefit of reform that's at stake. If the repeal law were to become law, Insurers could impose devastating annual and lifetime benefit caps. Young adults would lose coverage on their parents' plans. Pregnant women and breast cancer and prostate cancer survivors could be denied coverage when they most need it. Seniors would pay higher prescription drug costs. Consumer protections for 445,000 constituents who have private insurance would be rescinded, resulting in higher health care costs and reduced coverage. 22,100 businesses and 91,000 families in my district would not receive tax credits to access better and more affordable coverage. Large insurers would no longer be required to spend at least 85% of premiums on health benefits and justify large rate increases. And reforms the Commonwealth Foundation estimates will lower the rate of premium increases by $2,000 on average by the end of the decade will be undone. I am very happy to work with anyone who genuinely wants to improve health coverage and make it more affordable. I am deeply concerned that this vote tomorrow is about keeping campaign promises without serious examination of the impact of this repeal, especially on Americans like my 27-year-old constituent in White Plains who has cancer. To my colleagues, if you want to help your constituents who have insurance, and the millions of Americans who don't, 
I urge you to vote no on repealing every consumer protection that benefits them. Thank you, and I yield back my time. The gentlewoman yields back her time. The chair recognizes Mr. Paulson of Minnesota. Mr. House for five minutes, revise it. Without objection, for five minutes, recognize. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I rise to commemorate the service of my dear friend, Arlene Bush, who is entering her 30th year as a member of the Bloomington School Board in Minnesota. Arlene, who turns 80 later on this year, first joined the school board in 1981. And while times have changed since then, Arlene's dedication to Bloomington students and the schools that they attend has not. She started her own educational journey in a small, two-room schoolhouse in the tiny town of Odin, Minnesota. Later, she moved to Minneapolis, where she graduated from high school in 1948. Later after that, she got married and she settled in Bloomington, Minnesota, which at that time was a growing suburb of Minneapolis, where she raised six daughters before beginning her long career in public service. Arlene's big heart and humble demeanor immediately endeared her to new friends. She makes a point to be a community leader not only through the duties of her position, but by being present at sporting events, plays, pep fests, musicals, concerts and ceremonies celebrating the young people of Bloomington. She not only advocates for Bloomington students on the board, she encourages them personally every chance she gets. She understands that children need not only financial and operational support in their education, she exemplifies a leader who invests in their interests, recognizes their achievements, and comforts them in times of adversity. Arlene's milestone isn't one that can be measured in the number of hours logged in meetings or the number of terms that she's served, but rather in the lives of the thousands, the literally thousands of students that have benefited from her commitment to education. Over the years, the name Arlene Bush has become synonymous with education among the generations of Bloomington students whose lives have been enriched through her many years of service. She's a pillar of the community whose presence on the school board has absolutely provided a steady hand as times have changed. As a father with four daughters in public schools myself, it is reassuring to know there are dedicated public servants like Arlene out there working to give our children the best education possible. And like Arlene, these unsung heroes don't do it for the glory or admiration. They do it simply because they share a common desire to better our community. And these kind souls prove you don't have to be a congressman or a senator to change the world or touch someone's life. Inside all of us is the ability to contribute to the public good and to make the world a better place for future generations. When asked recently to look back on her many years of service on the school board, Arlene replied in very true Minnesota fashion, she wasn't boastful or proud, but rather humbled. She said that she was thankful for the opportunity to serve. Mr. Speaker, as I close, I just want to take the time to let Arlene know that we too are thankful. Thankful for her desire to serve. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time, Ms. Ross Leighton of Florida. Mr. Fleming of Louisiana. Without objection, the ordering of a five-minute special order in favor of the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Dold, is vacated. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Dold, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Mr. Speaker. It is with tremendous honor, excitement, and humility that I rise to the floor of this great chamber to represent the aspirations and hardworking values of Illinois' 10th Congressional District, Chicago's north and northwest suburbs. Let me begin by expressing our thoughts and prayers remain with Congresswoman Giffords as she undergoes her recovery. My heart goes out to her and her family, along with the other families whose lives have been changed by this tragedy in Tucson on January 8th. Tonight, I am here to continue the tradition of this congressional seat by delivering a speech that lays out how I intend to legislate and explains the manner in which I will work with my colleagues to move this country forward. Over the past 18 months, I have traveled all over our great district, trying to ask people what keeps them up at night. Stretching from Wilmette to Waukegan, Libertyville to Glenview, Highland Park to Palatine, 
I am fortunate to represent a congressional district that encompasses a diverse community that asks its political leaders to tackle a wide-ranging, ambitious agenda. And from all conversations I've had at train stations, in town centers, at countless small businesses, in diners, and in town hall meetings, there's one thing I know. The 112th Congress must focus on jobs and the economy, on reining in the out-of-control spending here in Washington, and to make sure that our country remains safe and free. Beyond talking with members of my community, I also took the time to study the heritage of the congressional seat representing the people of Northern Cook and Eastern Lake Counties. Beginning with our first representative, John McLean, upon Illinois' founding statehood in 1818, ours is an area that has always demanded a high standard of leadership, a commitment to local issues, and yet an eye towards American leadership in the world. Our community is bound by deep-rooted characteristics, namely a desire for pragmatic, effective leadership, vigorous independence, and the ability to work with the other side of the aisle in a civilized and bipartisan manner. These are the virtues that I pledge to continue in Congress as I begin my service to the people of the 10th Congressional District. In looking at the work of my predecessors, I have come across a number of individuals who served our area in the highest tradition of public service with a commitment to the greater good. Tonight, I would like to take a moment to speak about a few of them. The first woman to represent Northeastern Illinois in Congress did so with remarkable distinction, skill, and effectiveness. Marguerite Stitt Church took to Congress in 1949, succeeding her late husband, Congressman Ralph Church. She served until 1962, promoting fiscal restraint, equal pay for women, and civil rights initiatives. She held a healthy disdain for the extravagant federal spending, which we can all certainly appreciate today. And foreshadowing the men who would follow her, Marguerite Church encouraged democratic reforms abroad from her position on the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Mrs. Church retired in 1963, only to be succeeded in the 88th Congress by a man who also took to causes of fiscal conservatism and American leadership in the world, Donald Rumsfeld. The people of Northeastern Illinois elected Secretary Rumsfeld, a fellow Nutrier High School graduate, to Congress at the young age of 30. From 1963 to 1969, he served our area with great distinction. He had a spot on the Joint Economic Committee, and during perhaps the most critical time in the development of our space program, he sat on the House Committee on Science and Aeronautics. As many know, his tenure in Congress was just the beginning of a long career in public service. Ten years later saw the beginning of another incredible career devoted to public service. For 21 years, John Porter served the people of the 10th District. In that time, he made his great mark on both at home and abroad, serving on the Appropriations Committee as the chairman of the Subcommittee on Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education, John Porter achieved a record of tremendous legislative success, reflecting on the values of his district. He advocated for scientific funding and advancements in health care research, displayed a commitment to the environment, championed a strong respect for the taxpayer, and set a standard for high-quality constituent service. John Porter also recorded impressive accomplishments in the areas of foreign policy. After a trip to the Soviet Union, he founded the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. This led to him help, refu help free refuseniks in Russia, fight for the rights of North Korean refugees, and work for the religious freedom in China. I am honored and fortunate to have Congressman Porter's support and valuable mentorship as I begin my career in this body. For the past decade, and following in Congressman Porter's footsteps, the people of the 10th Congressional District have been tremendously fortunate to enjoy the representation of Mark Kirk. In Congress, Mark Kirk set the standard for thoughtful, independent leadership, and his centrist pragmatism mirrored the value of secret to me nor anyone who followed his career. Mark Kirk worked tirelessly 
in all areas of our district. The Illinois 10th Congressional District is a unique area that demands sensible independent leadership. Congressman Kirk knew the people, he knew their concerns, and perhaps most importantly, he knew how to translate that into action and legislative successes. To look at his record of accomplishments in the areas of foreign policy, defense, environmental protection, human rights, transportation, and on the economy, is to see a representative who knows what his constituents value most. His record as a fiscal conservative and a social moderate, his desire to reach across the aisle in search of the best ideas, these are the qualities that I hope to carry forward as I begin my career in public service to the people of the 10th District. I am honored and fortunate to call now Senator Kirk a close friend, a valued mentor. We are comforted by the fact that Senator Kirk continues to represent the state of Illinois and all Americans in the United States Senate. And the communities of Northern Cook and Eastern Lake Counties are privileged to share his talents with the rest of the state and the country. Like Congressman Porter and Congressman Kirk, I too will represent our independent-minded congressional district by working in a bipartisan fashion, by listening to all people for the best ideas, and by governing in a pragmatic, sensible manner. The American people demand solutions. And I will always remember that all of us are here to improve the lives of all Americans. While we can and should disagree at times, I am committed to the principles of open debate, the free exchange of ideas, and to charitably interpreting and considering other positions, all with a common objective, improving the lives of America. To that end, I will be a strong and independent fiscal conservative and social moderate. That, I believe, matches our community's values, and so accurately and valuably represented before me by Congressman Porter and Congressman Kirk. I ran for Congress because I wanted to get this nation back to work. To me, that centers on three things. Jobs and jump-starting the economy, reining in the out-of-control spending here in Washington, and making sure that our country remains safe and free. Our first priority in this Congress must be to help ensure that the best conditions exist to create good jobs, high-paying and secure jobs for all people across this country, and to preserve those that already exist. It's jobs first and foremost. As I've so often been reminded, the unemployment rate nationally is 9.4 percent. In Illinois, it's even higher. And in certain communities within the 10th District, the unemployment rate is higher than 20 percent. To me, this is simply unacceptable, which is why I will highlight, strengthen, and support those local institutions that provide critical job skills training to the unemployed. On a more fundamental level, however, we need laser-like focus on job creation. This means establishing certainty across America for employers, keeping taxes low, maintaining vigorous oversight on federal regulations, and expanding opportunities so that businessmen and women can do what they were meant to do, to innovate, to prosper, to grow, to invest, and to hire. We need to ensure that the federal government is not making it more difficult and more costly for businesses to put the key in the door and open up their businesses each and every day. As a small business owner myself, I am here as part of a wave of people who know firsthand what it takes to run a company, to meet a payroll and to meet a budget, and to create jobs. This is not theory, but rather this is common sense, proven, practical approach, which will guide my philosophies in this Congress. This is a great American priority, and we must get it right. Next, we must tackle federal spending and get it under control to get our fiscal house in order. There can be no greater example as to the urgency of this matter than what happened in my home state of Illinois this last week. During the final hours of the state's legislative session last Wednesday, Illinois state lawmakers passed a massive state income tax increase to make up for the state's rampant, unchecked spending. With a 66% increase in personal income tax rate and corporate income tax rates, tax rates also rising dramatically, families and businesses in Illinois are being punished because 
the politicians cannot control themselves and the spending. This acts as a huge additional burden with no meaningful state commitment to cut spending. This is a devastating for job creation in a state that so desperately needs it. We need to encourage job creation and this will only increase the trend of employers not hiring, laying off, and potentially even leaving the state. I will work hard to make sure that the 10th District, American families and businesses are not put in a similar position, crippling themselves here at the federal level. And that work begins immediately. Tomorrow afternoon, this House will vote on health care reform, an area where I think last year we missed a golden opportunity. Last year's health care overhaul addressed access to insurance, but it failed to address cost or quality of health care. Earlier today, I held an event in my district in Vernon Hills to highlight yet one small, very small section in this legislation, one that will have a devastating impact on businesses. The new 1099 rules. This provision will unfairly burden small businesses with mounds of paperwork and compliance fees and will certainly hinder the economy at the worst possible time. Fortunately, I believe that most in this body see the wisdom in correcting this terrible legislative mistake. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of this bill to repeal these unworkable and unnecessary and unproductive 1099 rules. I look forward to working with both Republicans and Democrats to keep this legislation simple and to pass it as soon as possible. Now, when we look at health care, there are certainly some good aspects of this law. The coverage of pre-existing conditions for one that should be strongly considered. Going forward, uh, there is also keeping children on your insurance till they're 26. But there's a lot, plenty, that needs to be corrected. And we need to put a better system in place. I firmly believe that affordable and accessible health care is a vital issue. And we need to make sure that it is available to all Americans. But we need to be talking about meaningful malpractice reform interstate competition, consumer-driven care, and tax breaks for individuals to purchase insurance on their own, just like businesses have today. The American people deserved better. They deserve health care reform that passes the House with broad bipartisan support. One of the reasons for the major flaws in this health care law is that broad bipartisan cooperation did not happen. Rather, the law grew out of a closed legislative process where some of the best ideas to lower costs and to raise quality were ignored. We cannot afford another missed opportunity. As such, I invite members, all members of this Congress, Republicans and Democrats, to reach across party lines so that we can produce the best bill with the best ideas for the American public. In that spirit is my intent to introduce a practical and centrist alternative to the current health care law. This plan will reduce health care costs and expand insurance coverage without raising taxes, and will guarantee that the government does not come between a decision you make with your doctor. It will address malpractice reform and allow an, any, any individual who finds a plan that better suits them anywhere in our nation to be able to purchase it. It is critical that we move forward in this area of health care reform so that we can have the best system possible, one that works for all Americans. This is a sentiment that I have consistently heard in communities all across the 10th District. Another concern I hear all over our district and a major priority of mine is to keep our nation safe and free. The 10th District is fortunate to have a tradition of congressional leadership on national defense and foreign affairs. And I look forward to stepping forward in this area. I will always be focused on keeping our nation strong and free. And it will be an honor to work to support the incredible men and women who wear our nation's uniform and service. On a more local level, I will be an advocate for our veterans as they return home and become acquainted with the beautiful Captain James A. Lovell Federal Health Center in North Chicago. This is the first fully integrated federal health care center between the VA and the Department of Defense. And we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Senators Kirk and Durbin, along with many others, for bringing it to our community. This facility shows our commitment to those who serve, but it also shows and serves as a reminder of the sacrifice required to protect American freedoms. 
Currently, I believe Iran's pursuit of a nuclear weapon to be the biggest threat to our national security and to our democratic allies abroad. The sanctions that Congress passed last year are clearly having an impact on the Iranian regime, but I believe that we cannot rest until the Iranian nuclear threat is affirmatively and effectively dismantled. I pledge to aggressively monitor developments in this area and search for ways which I can help in Congress, because a nuclear armed Iran is simply unacceptable. In my mind, one of the best ways to combat this Iranian threat is a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. I traveled to Israel this past year in order to see firsthand the security challenges the United States and Israel currently face together in the Middle East. As such, I fully understand why a strong U.S.-Israel relationship is critical for the United States, and I look forward to using my voice here in Congress to continue to advocate for its strengthening. Finally, I'd like to turn to two areas that are particularly important to me and to the people of my district, education and the environment. I believe that education is the building block for a prosperous America of tomorrow. We must encourage schools to prepare our students for, for, for success in the jobs our modern economy demands. And I'm confident in the ability of our local school districts to prepare our students appropriately. I do believe a one-size-fits-all model stymies innovation and in, in education. Accordingly, we must give more authority and control to local school districts. However, we must not allow unfunded federal mandates and programs to get in the way of our local school districts providing high-quality education. As a scout, a boy scout and a scout, now a scoutmaster, I was taught by my scoutmasters, Lee Getcho, Charlie Barnes, and Artie Bergman, to love the out of doors and nature. In northeastern Illinois, we are fortunate to be stewards of one of the greatest natural resources in the world, Lake Michigan. With 26 miles of Lake Michigan shoreline, the 10th Congressional District enjoys tremendous benefits from its precious resource. We have an important obligation to preserve and protect this great natural resource that is vital to the 10th District and to the entire United States. From drinking water to recreational opportunities, I will work diligently to protect the lake to improve her water quality. I will also work with local, state, and federal parties to clean up Waukegan Harbor and delist this wonderful resource as an area of environmental concern once and for all. Focusing on jobs in the economy, reigning in federal spending and keeping our nation safe and free, and working to strengthen our nation's health care system, our education system, and our environment. These are major legislative goals for the 112th Congress. And in the tradition of those who have served the people of Chicago's north and northwest suburbs before me, I look to be a voice of pragmatic, centrist ideas, someone who listens to all people on both sides of the aisle and looks for ways that we can work together to best serve the American people. As a fiscal conservative and a social moderate, I'm a firm believer in smaller government. This will guide my service in this House. I have some very large shoes to fill, but it is my promise that I will represent this office with dignity, distinction, honor, and above all, integrity. I thank the people of the 10th District of Illinois for the opportunity to serve them, I will never forget why I am here or who I am here to represent. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamundi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for this opportunity to discuss this evening health care. But before I get to health care, I was notified early this afternoon that a very unique, iconic American 
had died today. Sergeant Shriver is no longer with us. This individual has had an impact on America and the world around us that will last for centuries. He literally created the United States Peace Corps. The idea was developed by he and his brother-in-law, JFK, and put into effect in the first year of the Jack Kennedy administration. Thousands, indeed, over nearly 200,000 Americans have joined the Peace Corps in the ensuing years. For my wife and I, it changed our life. It changed the path upon which we have traveled. We were the third iteration of the Peace Corps back in the 60s. We were sent to Ethiopia. We served in a village out in the boondocks of southwestern Ethiopia. And it put in place in our lives the vision that we could and should continue to serve. We're not alone. Thousands upon thousands of Americans, those that were in Peace Corps and those that were affected by Peace Corps here in this nation, found that same mission of being a life of service. In the 1990s, Sergeant Shriver returned once again to assist the Peace Corps as the Clinton administration undertook the rebuilding and expansion of the Peace Corps. My wife was then working at the Peace Corps as the associate director, and together they and the other staff opened the Peace Corps to the former Soviet Union nations, Eastern Europe and beyond, at the, and also to South Africa. It was a period of growth, and once again, it was a period in which the Shriver enthusiasm and the Shriver determination to reach out to everyone in this world so that they could have a better life was create, created these opportunities. We mourn his passage. Our prayers go out to his family and to remind all of us that we too, in any way possible, should be serving our fellow man. Sergeant Shriver, we miss you. And we know that America and millions of people around the world that were affected by your programs will miss you also. Let me now turn to another issue that affects every American, their well-being, their lives, their ability to get the care that they need when they have health care problems. On this floor today, we began the debate of the repeal of the Affordable Health Care Act, an extraordinary law that will affect each and every one of us in this nation. And as it affects us, it will also affect people around the world. Because this law will help America finally join the other industrialized nations in the world and provide health care to all of our people, not just those who are fortunate enough to be employed by an employer who has found it useful, wise, or even correct to provide health care for their employees, but for those individuals that are not so fortunate to be with an employer that does not provide health care, and for those who are unemployed. This is an extremely important debate going on here on the floor of the House. It's a debate about all of our lives. It was estimated before this law went into effect that some 30 to 40,000 Americans every year lost their life because they did not have health care. It was too late for them to get their blood pressure under control. It was too late for them to deal with their diabetic situation or their cancer had run its course so that it was not treatable. 30 to 40,000 Americans every year. That's not the way America should be. We should be providing insurance to all Americans. On the floor today, the debate commenced and I was pleased and a bit curious to hear my colleagues on the Republican side talk about repeal and replace. And as they talked about what they would replace, I began to say, excuse me, wait a minute. What you're replacing is already the law in America. The health care bill that became law this year deals with every American from birth, through their school years, through their years as building a family, in their employment, and through their retirement. 
It deals with the entire cycle of life by providing the opportunity for health insurance, improved health insurance at every stage of life. Let me show you how that works. It's the patient's bill of rights, which apparently our Republican colleagues want to repeal. The patient's bill of rights is a fundamental reform of the insurance industry. I was insurance commissioner for eight years in California. And I understand the insurance industry very, very well. And it's about profit. All too often, the health insurance industry puts people before profit. Actually, it's the other way around. Profit before people. So in doing so, they deny coverage. The patient's bill of rights goes directly to this issue of the insurance companies putting profit before people. Let me show you where this works. Children. My very first speech here on the floor as the health care debate came up in 2009, in November of 2009, I spoke to an individual, a friend of ours who lives here in Washington, whose child was born with a very serious kidney problem. The mother was covered by insurance through the pregnancy, through the delivery. The child, the moment it was discovered that that child had this pre-existing kidney ailment, they dropped the coverage on the child. The family struggled and continues to struggle to provide care for that child, limping along, trying to get the money together for the next procedure to provide the services that are necessary, the transplant. All of those things should have been covered by insurance, but with the insurance company putting profit before people, they denied that child coverage. The patient's bill of rights stops that and says that every child has a right to coverage, no longer the kind of discrimination that took place here with my friend's family. Secondly, young adults. I happen to have had six young adults. All of them have passed through the age of 23, and that period when their coverage stopped was the scary time for us in our family. And it is for every other family in America. At the age of 23, insurance companies were allowed to drop patients' coverage. And if you're a 23-year-old and you have any kind of a pre-existing condition, you're out of luck. The Patient's Bill of Rights guarantees that that young woman or man will be able to get coverage until the age of 26. And if they have a pre-existing condition, that can no longer be a reason to deny coverage. <clears throat> the Patient's Bill of Rights would be repealed by the piece of legislation that will be brought to this floor tomorrow. If you're a woman, you have a pre-existing condition. It's called being a female. And routinely, and I've seen this by, during my tenure as insurance commissioner, routinely the insurance companies would deny coverage because you're a woman and you might get pregnant or you might have any number of conditions. That will no longer be the case. If you happen to have cancer, you cannot be denied, be denied coverage. The Patient's Bill of Rights protects every single American when it comes to getting insurance and keeping insurance. Many other provisions are in this bill, and I find it astounding that our colleagues on the Republican side would repeal the Patient's Bill of Rights and literally open every single American up to the gross discrimination that the insurance companies have foisted upon Americans for decades, putting profits before people. There are many other parts to the Patient's Bill of Rights, but I want to just take a moment and invite to this conversation my colleague from the great state of New Jersey, Frank Pallone, who's been fighting this fight for decades, both as a uh, member of Congress and as a concerned citizen. Mr. Pallone, if you'll join us, share with us your thoughts and your experiences, and we'll continue on with this discussion. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank you um, for all that you do on this issue. I've seen you come to the floor so many times over the last year or, or more uh, talking about uh, the importance of the health care reform, and now, of course, pointing out how ridiculous it is to, uh, to try to repeal it, which is what the Republicans are going to try to do tomorrow. I, I just wanted to start out by saying that, you know, when, I, when I'm home, and, you know, we were just home for the, uh, 
uh, for the uh, Martin Luther King uh, weekend. And so there was an opportunity to talk to a lot of people for the, at the various Martin Luther King events and, you know, over the three or four days that, that we were home. And um, the issue is jobs. That's all people want to talk about. Everyone uh, comes up to me and says, you know, what are you going to do about the economy? What are you going to do about jobs? Nobody talks about repealing uh, the health reform bill. And um, what, I, what I get, uh, basically, from my constituents is, you know, they, they know the health reform bill passed. They know that it's uh, kicking in. A lot of the patients' protections that you mentioned have already kicked in. Uh, and they want to see how it goes. They, you know, even, even those who are not necessarily for it in the beginning uh, think it's a complete waste of time for us to be rehashing the debate and talking about repeal because they want to see... Uh, what, what's actually going to happen with the health care reform and to the extent that they've seen certain things, uh, p protections kick in, they're happy with it. And what they say to me is, look, if, if over the next few years the certain aspects don't work out, then, you know, you can go back and revisit it and uh, maybe make some changes. Nobody's suggesting we can't make changes on a bipartisan basis. But this idea of just repealing it outright when it just you know, went into effect a, a few months ago, no one, almost no one I talked to is in favor of that. They just don't think that makes sense. Um, the other thing that, that, that uh, I wanted to say, and I keep stressing over and over again, I actually have this chart, and I know you pointed to it as well, is that who is going to actually gain from the repeal? We know that um, insurance companies uh, uh, keep raising their prices. We know that historically they tried to discriminate by eliminating, eliminating people who have pre-existing conditions or having lifetime caps on insurance policies. Um, the only ones that gain from this repeal uh, are the insurance companies because essentially they can go back uh, to the situation, to the status quo, uh, where they can have double-digit uh, um, premium increases. You know, you know in your own state of California it wasn't unusual to have 30 percent, I think, Blue Cross just announced a 50-something percent increase. Uh, and then, so they make money by, by constantly raising premiums and also by discrimination. In other words, if you have uh, a policy, uh, a woman, for example, that has uh, breast cancer, um, you know, and then she has a recurrence, well, if she reaches the cap on coverage for the year or the cap on coverage for, the, for a lifetime, then she has no insurance to cover her reoccurring uh, cancer. Or... Um, the other, uh, the other thing that sometimes it would even rescind a policy if they could find some way to say that, uh, you know, that the, it, it didn't apply to you. They would simply rescind it altogether, and you'd get sick and wouldn't have insurance at all, even when you thought you, you had the greatest need for it. So I, I just want to stress. I mean, this this chart says GOP patients' rights repeal will put insurance companies back in charge, where children with pre-existing conditions are denied coverage, young people aged 26 can't stay on their parents' plan. Pregnant women and breast and prostate cancer patients could be thrown off insurance rolls. That's the rescission. Seniors pay more for their drugs. Uh, the bill, as you know, has, uh, for those who are in the donut hole, uh, until this bill went to effect, if you reached the donut hole, then you had to pay 100% for your, for your prescription drugs. You got a $250 rebate last year. As of January 1st, you have a 50% reduction, uh, and that's going to eventually become zero, so you'll have complete coverage under Medicare Part D. Um, so you repeal it, seniors are going to pay more for their drugs. And, you know, that's the other thing that is amazing, is they talk about how this is going to, uh, I, I guess they're not using the term killer, killing jobs anymore. They, they got away from Crush. that. What is it now? Crush. Crush? Crush jobs. Crush jobs. Uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is that, um, that the bill actually decreases the deficit by $230 billion, so you'd be increasing the deficit if you repealed the bill. And um, with regard to uh, jobs, I mean, look, if, if you think about what's in the bill, the, the, because everybody gets coverage, you're going to have to have a lot more health professionals, so that creates jobs. Because uh, premiums will stabilize, employers uh, won't have the double-digit inflation that comes and makes it harder for them to hire people. So just the fact that your premiums stabilize makes it easier for employers to hire people. And then we have all kinds of funding for research uh, at labs and hospitals and institutions around the country. Even the R&D creates jobs. So it creates jobs uh, is the bottom line. But I, I'd really like to go back um, 
to, the same, to, to where I started from, and then I'll yield back to the gentleman. And that is, um, most people just say to me, why are the Republicans doing this? Let this uh, bill kick in. Let us get to the point where everyone's covered. Let's see how it works. We know the Senate's not going to pass the repeal. The president's not going to sign the repeal. So rather than spend our time trying to figure out ways of creating jobs, we just uh, debate this for another week uh, for, no, for no purpose, just as a waste of time. I certainly yield back. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Pallone. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of a, if it's about jobs, then why are we doing all of this? It's interesting to note, and I heard this debate earlier on the floor here, that uh, this is a job crusher, to, to be politically correct now, uh, and that uh, businesses are going to lose uh, jobs, when in fact, since the bill became law, over 932,000 private sector jobs have been created. So there's no evidence in the large job market that this legislation, the health care reform, has harmed jobs, crushed jobs. It hasn't happened. In fact, nearly a million new jobs have been created, 932,000. In addition to that, this is an extremely important bill for small businesses. This bill, as you said, actually subsidizes the cost of health care for small businesses. If you have less than uh, 25, excuse me, 50 employees, you can get a subsidy up to 35 percent for buying health care for your employees. And if you don't want to buy health care, you don't have to if you have less than 50 employees. So I'm going, I don't understand this debate about small businesses being harmed. In fact, the Kaiser Family Foundation has uh, shown that in the last year, probably as a result of this bill, that's their conclusion, the number of small businesses providing health insurance has grown from 46 percent to 59 percent. If the gentleman would yield, um, one of the things that I wanted to point